Number 10, apple bobbing. Okay folks, time to paint a picture for you. I love doing this. It's a warm summer night. You're at the county fair. You've managed to eat enough fried food to feed a large family. And even more surprisingly, you fit into those blue jeans. They're tight. The sound of carnival games and people having fun pollutes the background. That's when you see her. She's tall, blonde, and is wearing a pair of cowboy boots. Yeehaw. She calls you over. There's an apple bobbing game. You've never bobbed for apples before, but to impress the pretty lady in cowboy boots, you go for it anyway. You fail, and now you're cold, wet, and ladyless. Yes, this fine American carnival game gets its roots from the Middle Ages. It's simple, fun, and no matter what time period you live in, sometimes it was even used as a form of dating, which is kind of weird, actually. Names were written on the apples, kind of like speed dating, and then you'd bob for them, and then you'd go off of whoever's name was on the apple. I I've done it before. I'm not very good at apple bobbing. And now I'm just cold, wet, and maidenless. Number nine, Kitty Bonfire. This is the worst. Yeah, I've talked a lot about a lot of naughty stuff in my time here as the king of the hive, but this one, it just sucks, dude. Look, we've all been bored before. I have too. Have we all done stupid things when we're bored? Yes. Remember Roman candles? You point them at each other, you shoot the fireworks at each other. Some of you done it. Don't lie to me. I know you did. Sure, that's just a part of growing up though. However, growing up in the Middle Ages, and more specifically in France, uh, they liked to have barbecues. Except it wasn't delicious mouth-watering ribs or chicken, it was cats. And it wasn't for eating, but just for entertainment. Yeah, just for a, a, a good old laugh. Uh, don't have time today, but I've got a great story about a stray cat. Maybe I'll, I'll use that for my first stand-up routine, we'll see. But regardless, I'm just trying to have fun in this one because it just makes me sad. Let's move on to the next one. Number eight, mob football. Football is the world sport. Name a country, they probably have a team in it. And Canada might even bring the cup home this year, boys and girls. Now that would be cool. However, uh, the billion dollar sport was nothing close to what it is today. Football has rules, regulations, and athletes performing at peak performance. Ronaldo was one heck of a player. In medieval times, there were no rules on how many players there could be. Sometimes it was even whole towns versus one another. The ball? <laughs> Not something you can find in the back of your favorite department store. It was an inflated pig bladder. Ugh. The only goal was to get it to the other side with any means necessary, which oftentimes meant it was going to get physical. A lot, a lot of beating and whatnot, a lot of hitting. Not very good, don't do that. I'll stick uh, not playing that sport, thanks. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe we got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal. That's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages. What can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War. Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance in literature and all that good stuff from growing up. And in the middle ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended, of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark, holy sh**. Number six. The feudal system, aka feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renter's agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, AKA the landowner, AKA your landlord, allowing vassals, AKA tenants, to rent the land by providing services especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs, who were laborers, who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These were the lowest class of people, and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain in good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on. A three day work week? Plant a couple carrots here and there? Hey, it doesn't seem that bad. Number five, fear the dead. 
With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archaeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently, this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four. Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you this school hoodie were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generali were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number Number three, medieval taverns. Say you want to grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully, maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the middle ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, yeah, I guess that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party, but if you made a weak ale or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then, and only then, do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the Apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the 5th century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo! Shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder! Go! Go! Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, dancing plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the dancing plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh but it's, I can't, I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trofea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more. All moving their bodies with a similar, wacky, frantic twist. This was long before Chubby Checker came along, so we still have no idea what was going on here. Like, we're out of guesses at this point. This twist lasted for months. People were dropping on the spot. It was scary and confusing. In total, there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness. That's a lot of deaths. That's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think this story is made up per se. No one would make this up. It's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it! Some suggest this was a cult, others believe they ate toxic rye. Who's to say for sure? Either way. We're all dead. At number 10, Groom of the Stool. There were a lot of really horrible jobs back in the Middle Ages. I mean, these people literally took any task you could think of and turned it into an actual profession. From fetching water from the nearest stream to handing drinks to people, everyone had some kind of job. But with that said, some jobs were worse than others, and here's one of them. 
The groom of the stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry a commode around at all times, waiting for the king to do his business, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have to, quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. You know you're well off when you hire someone just to take care of your bodily business. Talk about a crappy job. On number nine, kissing sheets. For thousands of years, one of the biggest threats that people of royal or high status had to worry about was being taken out by their enemies. Monarchs worried about the threat of being poisoned by their enemies as it was one of the most common methods of offing someone. So they thought of an array of precautions to take in order to prevent being taken out by some kind of spicy death sauce or something. Many monarchs hired tasters to try their food before it was given to the king to make sure it wasn't poisoned, but some monarchs were also afraid of being poisoned through something that they touched. This is why Henry VIII hired someone with a very important job to make sure that his bed wasn't poisoned. The person who was tasked with making the king's bed was also required to kiss every part of his bed every morning. They would kiss the pillows, the sheets, and blankets to prove that someone hadn't smeared poison on it. The king was also concerned with people poisoning his clothes too, as well as his sons, and so they would be tested for poison before they got dressed. Henry VIII was really out here providing employment for just about every weird task you could think of. Before we carry on talking about some of the strangest professions from back in the Middle Ages, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Leech Collector. Back in the Middle Ages, things were still quite underdeveloped, like medicine for example. In our last video, I told you guys about alchemists who, at the time, were pretty much the ones who sought out cures for different ailments. Because science wasn't really known to them back then, they tried using whatever they could find to create cures, and one of the most common things that were used in medicine were leeches. Now, as we've learned by now, anything could become a job in the Middle Ages, and so gathering leeches became a profession. What's even weirder than the fact that finding leeches was someone's job is the method of how they collected those bad boys. Leech collectors would wade into the water with bare legs and wait for the leeches to come to them. They would swish around and try to gather as many leeches on their body as possible. They would then get out of the water and pry the leeches off, putting them into a bucket and selling them to people in town like barber surgeons and other medical professionals. Now I can't say I've ever had a leech on me, so I don't really know what it feels like, but I can imagine that it's an uncomfortable feeling, so to have a bunch of them all over you must have been a nightmare. Number 7. The Battle of Bannockburn This infamous battle between Scotland and England was one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. The end of the bloody war for independence. Basically, Scotland was like, yeah, we're gonna go over here and roll our R's. The gruesome wooden wars were caused by the English invading Scotland in 1296. A leader slowly rising the ranks, William Wallace, the guardian of the King of Scotland himself, holds off the English forces and is knighted a hero to Scotland. Unfortunately, like everyone, Every hero back then, he was also hated. He was captured, hanged, drawn, and quartered. Like, why do you have to do all that after he dies? Like, he's dead. Not fun. The battles between Scotland and England ended in 1314 with Robert the Bruce securing Scotland's independence, adding like 45 more dialects to the UK. Freedom! Number six, the Black Death. Ooh, talk about a curveball. The year's 1348. People are saying things like, don't let the bed bugs bite. Clearly not a very clean and safe time. The Black Death, aka Pestilence, aka the Great Mortality, or simply known as the Plague. Single-handedly the worst pandemic ever recorded in history, wiping out somewhere between 70 to 200 million people. Ooh, now I get where bless you comes from. Someone sneezed back then and everyone's dead at 14. This is where we see those doctors in the terrifying bird outfits with the long noses stuffed with garlic and herbs. Um, excuse me? Yeah, he's not wearing a mask. I'm just trying to watch a cat publicly get skinned. Yeah, six feet please. Some doctors prescribed urinating on a person so that the bad smell would drive out the infection. Can you imagine? Just a doctor writing you up a script and go ahead and pee on yourself about four to five times a day. Take with food should be gone early next week. And just let me put my mask back on here before you leave. 
There you are. The plague started in Europe in October 1347 when 12 ships from the Black Sea docked at the Sicilian port of Messina. Most sailors aboard the ships were already dead. But those who were still alive were covered head to toe in black boils that oozed pus and blood. Ugh. Sometimes the black death included fever, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, temporary loss in motor skills, and then of course, death. Number 5. Joan of Arc Finally, a woman in the Middle Ages! Who to thunk? Joan of Arc was considered and still is revered the heroine of France for her role in the Siege of Orleans during France's Hundred Year War with England. Joan of Arc, a peasant with faith on her side, had believed that God had chosen her to lead France in victory against England and had spoken to her since she was young. At only age 17, she had stolen men's armors, a white horse, and like a Valkyrie riding into battle, she had convinced an entire army that she was appointed by God to win. And then did! That's the most badass thing I've ever heard. My entire life. After such a miraculous victory, her reputation spread among France, and upon her capture and death at 19, the Maid of Orleans herself would forever live on as one of the greatest saints and symbols of the country of France. Number 4. Henry V. Another war? All these people do is kill each other. Does anyone fish? Or golf? No one, huh? Just swords and heads, swords and heads. A history itself. This time, England beats France. King Henry V, Prince Hal himself, leans into his kingly duties, demolishing France and what Shakespeare would delve into years to come. The Battle of Agincourt is one of England's most celebrated victories and was one of the most important triumphs in the Hundred Years' War. Then, should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword, and fire crouch for employment, Henry V, prologue. Good stuff. How come these guys didn't just like rap battle or play soccer or something? Like an arrow right through the chest is way worse than a red card. Just saying. Hey, speaking of soccer. Number three, mob football. I'm not talking about the mafia. Put a thousand on Brady, would you? I'm talking about mob football, also known as folk football. It's just like our modern day soccer, town versus town. Except it has an unlimited amount of players. And there's only two rules to the game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's lines on the other side of town and no murdering. I mean, I guess this is closer to rugby? Yeah, this, this is literally just rugby. This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed at Oxford University in 1555. Just a guy named Jeeves in a polo. Oh uh, yeah, I play uh, mob football at Oxford. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm also in a frat. This game got so out of hand, it was banned numerous times in England. There is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbid. We command and forbid on behalf of the king, on pain of imprisonment, such game to be used in the city of the future. Thankfully, this game has calmed down over the years and now has become the most popular played and watched game across the world. Go Liverpool! Number two, the printing press. The printing press is a machine that was designed for the mass printing of text mostly in form of books and newspapers. With an unknown date of origin, first invented in China, this machine designed in the 15th century by Johannes Gutenberg was a revolutionary new form of writing which would only change the direction of history with the mass production of uniform text. Eh, long story short, people didn't have to get the world's worst wrist cramp writing Hamlet over and over again. To be or not to be 86 more folios? <sighs> The alphabetical metal keys would be placed into the device and slammed into the paper, pressing ink upon the parchment. You know there's gotta be some books half written in purple ink because they just ran out of black. Come on, we've all been there. Ink's expensive. Number one, William Shakespeare. The bard himself, arguably the most influential writer of the English language. William Shakespeare was born in Stratford, England. One of the easiest ways we can look back into the dialogue and lifestyle used by the people living in the Middle Ages. This playwright documents the world in which he lives from 1564 to 1616. Due to Shakespeare's unbelievable talent for building and fabricating an array of diverse stories and characters via players, Modern day is able to see the Middle Ages and the similarities and differences the people were experiencing. His plays are based in the environment that they were written in. He writes about diseases, he writes about monarchy, he writes about women's rights. Okay, so no one actually got turned into a donkey by some fairies in the woods, but some of those wars actually did happen. And some of those kings and queens were really twisted. How this man created so many brilliant works and stories, all part of the mystery. Kicking off the list at number 10, 
the Heretics Fork. Ah, uh, yes, I like sporks. This fork, I don't like. Another horrible thing for your neck right off the bat. Here we go. The Heretics Fork was designed so that nobody has to physically harm the victim, which is one of the worst, in my opinion, because now it's on them to get hurt from this punishment, and then no one has to even be responsible. A double-sided medieval fork, an old rusty, horrible fork, would be attached to your neck with a belt, anything that keeps the fork steady, you name it. So now the victim has to keep their neck straight, or else the obvious and horrible what happened? Ugh, I hate it. I have a long neck too. That would be a long commute down. I don't talk about punishments enough on this channel. Some of them I don't think I'm even allowed to, to be honest. The Heretic's Fork is no joke. We could thank the Spanish Inquisition for this device. Yeah. It was used from 1478 to 1834, most often to get the victim to confess to crimes. There's usually a Latin phrase on these heretic forks. That phrase is abiuro, translating to I recant. If you find a medieval fork in that third drawer down and it says that in Latin, Get out of the house, that's all I'm saying. Number nine, mob football. Ah yes, some medieval footy, let's do it. Growing up, I was lousy with footwork. I couldn't kick a ball for the life of me. Back in the 12th century, I would have been doomed, would have been game over. Back in those days, it was called football because you played this game on your feet. You didn't necessarily have to use your feet to further said ball. And also the goalposts were sometimes miles away, so it made sense to use a throw or two. Also, don't stress about picking favorites for your team. Each side consisted of 300 to 500 players, so plenty of room for you and yours. I also forgot the most important rule, of course. Um, you can fight each other. Yeah, you can full on have a brawl, whatever, no rules. It comes to no surprise that there were a few casualties, but finally this game was banned come 1359. King Edward III punished those who played ball by six days of imprisonment. Yeah, it turns out when there's a bubonic plague and you're at war, maybe fighting each other and breaking bones isn't the best way to kill time. You know, maybe go and hit the archery arena. Archery arena? Go shoot some arrows. Go practice, go, go break some pots. I don't know, whatever Link does in his off time. Number eight. Don't blow it. This one rings a familiar bell. This is pretty humorous, I'm not gonna lie. We'll lighten it up a bit. Back in the 12th century, horse racing was born in a Suffolk town called Newmarket. Once King James I got set up in 1606, the sport became more widely known and it was now a major form of entertainment as well. Eventually, laws had to be put in place to protect said prized pupils. Those horses were famous at this point, so if you think you can walk around the streets and, I don't know, blow your nose? Think again, pal. That's illegal. Yes, it was once illegal to blow your nose in the streets because officials didn't want horses getting ill. In fact, if you were outside sick at all, you had to pay a fine if you were caught. Yeah, imagine you're on your way to the doctors while you're sick, then you get pulled over for a temperature check. You're like, oh, not today, please, oh no. Number seven, wrapped up. One of the weirdest superstitions and traditions that still carries on today is that the bride cannot be seen by the groom before she walks down the aisle at the wedding. Why? Well, it's bad luck. After all, that could ruin a marriage. Not like any other factors would have a hand in that. Like in-laws from hell or spending way too much money on the wedding, putting you in crippling debt right as you're just about to start your life together, right? Well, this was the way of the medieval wedding. And something used to even keep things mysterious was for the bride to wear a veil. It was thought that it would protect her from evil spirits, but also keep her from being seen by the groom, which honestly sounds like it might have been worse. So when the groom got to unwrap his wife, if he didn't like it, well, sucks to suck, brother. Just imagine your bride walking down the aisle and then, yes, I will get married to you. Let's do it. Number six, Mr. Steal Yo Girl. This one's pretty messed up. I'm not even sure how this was even possible, but hey, here we go. So on your wedding night, it was the legal right of feudal lords to come on down to your place and shack up with your soon to be wife. What? Who most likely was a virgin? That's right, the government would come down and fornicate with your wife. Sounds just like the IRS. Anyway, this messed up tradition is somewhat shrouded in curiosity due to its extremely uncomfortable nature and its legitimacy. It may or may not have happened, or at least if it did, it might not have been as commonplace as some people may think. Moving forward, I think it's safe to say that this tradition can stay in the past, as there's no need for the mayor of my town to be sweet talking to my wife during the wedding. Hey, hey Mr. Mayor, you get your hands off of her. Number five, Mamma Mia. The best man at your wedding was most likely the groom's best friend who he most likely met in college and probably was part of his fraternity. And when given the mic to make a speech that was slightly inappropriate for younger audiences, the most common words of his vocabulary were probably bro and dude. 
All college friends put aside, the best man of the past had more of a greater responsibility than regaling the tale of the kegger at Stacy's house. Besides the feudal government coming to tickle your wife's fancy, there were others who wished to take the bride away, Bowser style. The best man's job was to prevent any of this from happening. Trying to get away with Koopa kidnapping meant the best man was going to do battle with you. Or just make sure the bride is protected. Like, you know, trying to run away from an arranged marriage because women are treated like property. Basically, he's a Luigi to Mario, except everyone actually respects Luigi in this case. Number 4. Arranged Marriages All this stuff sounds awful, and you might be thinking, why do these women go along with this? Well, it's because they didn't have a choice. A lot of women simply didn't have the right to choose who they married. Kind of a rough time for the ladies. I would also hardly call these marriages marriages as it really was more the lines of something like a business deal or a proposal. Families promise daughters to others. Being basically sold off to someone probably isn't a good feeling. For wealthier families like royals, a lot of times it was just about wealth and power, but also about keeping alliances, keeping borders in check. Your daughter marries my prince, now we're allies. Oh, you've got a son? Great, because I've got a niece that just turned 13. Gross. Number 3. Marital Disputes I like to joke around in this channel. Ah, oh, hell, who am I kidding? I like to joke around all the time. But this is kind of a touchy subject. But it's the truth. Considering everything else that was going on, and it's not that far from the truth to say, that women probably were not respected well inside the home either. This was a time long before equal rights and the resources that women today still need in case of domestic issues. I, as an internet comedian, cannot do the subject justice as it's something of a more sincere conversation to be had. However, I can talk about it from the medieval times. And some men just needed to be put in the naughty corner. Bad. Life was a lot harder for the average Joe back then, which means it was a lot tougher for the average Jane. Tough conditions don't excuse men treating women that way, but what I'm saying is, it just wasn't a great time overall, especially for the women. Naughty, stay in the naughty corner, you bad medieval men, bad. Number two, mail order. This kind of goes without saying, but men basically just got to pick a wife. Using money, power, or because somebody just owes you a favor. You get to pick out a wife. It was basically like shopping for a new car. You look around, check your options. Remember, this is the time when women were treated as property. Perhaps the biggest divide between men and women back then is that while men treat marriages like business or political agreements, they are still looking for love, where for a woman, she just doesn't have that option. Sometimes marriages go bad, but can you imagine what it would be like to be in a marriage you didn't even want to be in from the start? Man, that's rough. Number one, married games. This one is just too weird not to mention. Divorces were not that common back then. Till death do you part. And depending on if the church would even allow it, but however, in the yieldy times, in the land of Germany, there was a really, really messed up process called trial by combat, which basically meant when husbands and wives needed to work something out or separating, they fought for it, Hunger Games style. The man was placed in a hole to level the playing field, and the woman had a sack of rocks that she would use. Not that any married couple today would ever want to hit each other over the head with anything, right? Come on, that's no, you guys. You guys love each other. And when this display of happy matrimony was finished and a winner was declared, the other had their light snuffed out. In a nutshell, the only way to divorce or remarry was if your spouse ceased to exist. So here's some weapons to deal with it. Go ahead. Here you go. Crazy. At number ten, water carrier. These days, we have it so easy. We have the internet at our disposal to learn about pretty much anything, we have cars to get us from point A to point B, and all of our resources are close by. We get food from the grocery store and water from the taps in our houses. But back in the Middle Ages, things were a lot tougher for people, and they had to go through a lot just to get basic life necessities, like water for example. Getting water to people wasn't as easy as you might have thought, and so that's why getting water became a whole profession. In a medieval city, you lucked out depending on the area that you lived in. If you lived close to a river or stream, then you could get all the water you wanted and pretty easily too. But if you weren't so lucky to live near this resource, then you might have had to hire a water carrier to fetch it for you. People sought out strong young men to become water carriers for them, and as the name implies, they would get paid to go to the nearest source of water and bring it back for their employer. This profession became pretty popular in the late medieval period in London, and by this time, so many people were working as water carriers that they created their own fraternity. At number 9, Town Crier. I'm sure you've heard of the Town Crier at some point in your life, right? They're often incorporated into pop culture pieces that take place in the medieval times. When you think of the Town Crier, you might also think of the famous Hear Ye, Hear 
period that is associated with the speeches of the town criers. Back in the Middle Ages, the role of the town crier was a very important one as it was a crucial way for the local authorities to communicate with the residents of their community. The town crier would often make announcements of new laws, royal proclamations, the start of events, and even the punishments of criminals. They were basically the news anchors of the past. Also, as I mentioned, we normally associate the town crier with the phrase hear ye hear ye, but the phrase first started off as oye oye oye, which later evolved into the phrase that we are more familiar with. Before we carry on talking about these strange jobs from back in the days of old, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Scribe. These days, most people know how to read and write. It's part of our basic education, and is one of the first things that we are taught as kids in school. As you progress in society, basic literacy is taught more and more throughout the world, as some people in parts of the world might not have access to this privilege, but back in medieval times, most of the population was illiterate, which made the roles of scribes so crucial. Not everyone had access to the right education, but for those who did and could read and write, they often became scribes. The role of the scribe was as straightforward as the name predicts. Essentially, their job was to write. Scribes were hired to write all kinds of documents ranging from letters to business contracts. One of their hardest jobs though was to copy manuscripts, which was a job that may have taken a scribe several months to complete. Many men and women in monasteries held jobs as scribes, but for common folk in villages, being able to become a scribe was seen as highly valuable as well. Number 7. Pole Vaulting this is one of the most impressive sports to exist. We do not talk about pole vaulting enough. Pole vaulting is insane! Just guy with a stick over a building? Are you kidding? That's, that's Mario physics. Today we admire athletes like Sweden's Armand Mondo Duplantis. This guy broke the world record at the 2020 Olympics. He leaped over six meters with a stick. Back in the dark ages, however, this was not a sport. No, this was your commute. The day pole vaulting was born was supposedly Christmas Day, December 25th, 1521. A Christmas miracle. Now we have pole vaulting. A laborer named Robert Baker was heading home from the church. It was Christmas, he was tired. He decided to take a shortcut over a pond, so he grabbed a long pole and voila, he just made it. Now, don't try this. We don't recommend this as a travel option, obviously, because later on, Baker's pole ended up snapping mid-leap and then he ended up drowning, sadly. Yeah, the poor guy bridged to Terabithia himself, so I wouldn't recommend pole vaulting. Number six, the iron chair. Not to be confused with the Iron Throne, although I'm sure that seat isn't quite comfortable either. I have a funny back, you know, I have to, I gotta sit, ooh. That's where we go, who to crack in the mic. The Iron Chair was a device used in medieval punishments. Yeah, it sounds crazy to say, but this one seems more tame compared to some of the other devices used, you know? Like I mentioned the ducking stool in part one. That was, that was bad. This one's more Viking. This one's actually pretty brutal. These spikes don't look like much upon first glance, but they easily can poke through your skin. The chair is actually designed to pierce through the skin without hitting any vital organs. So you had to sit still. Definitely had to sit still. You know, I actually lied to you guys. The more I explain this one, the more I think it's the worst of the worst. I guess this is why they call it the Dark Ages. Oh my gosh. Number five, Bridget Bishop. In 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America, and then in result, you would get covered in these sores, like pimple-like bubbles. It was horrible, it was really painful. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the fine people of Salem thought, no, they're probably witches. I think they're, I think they're witches who can float and do magic, for sure. That seems more realistic, right? Yeah, for sure. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of this disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, obviously being, you know, extremely ill. The village doctor, William Greggs, just said at this point that they were bewitched. He's like, uh, here's a word. And they're like, great, that did nothing. He's like, okay. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, well, that's how science works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch. The reason they kicked off this entire Salem witch hunt was Bridget Bishop and her sickness. So over the next few months, around 150 more were convicted, all meeting their similar horrible fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop, or maybe it was just rye disease. Yeah, who would have thunk? 
Now it's referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions, everything's similar. It feels like there's bugs under your skin, which is the worst thing I've ever read in my entire life. But these doctors didn't know that at the time. Everyone thought they were all just cursed, witches. They were not cursed, they just needed help. It's really just that. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly ended. Huh, weird. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they just run out of contaminated rye bread? I vote the latter, it's probably the latter. Number four, steal. Don't steal, please. While it's next to impossible to prove your marriage to somebody back in the medieval days, imagine proving that you're innocent, that you didn't just steal an apple and run it through a village, right? It's also really tough to catch a thief. No alarms, no cameras. It was literally like Assassin's Creed. Just throw your hood up, grab an apple, and then sprint into the woods for 30 minutes and hope for the best. Hope an arrow doesn't go on the way out. That's really it. The markup for stealing was also pretty wild for the time. It kind of had to be. If you stole something worth half a mark in Danish controlled parts of England, you would be fined 80 times that whatever you stole. So you better be a track star. You better have one of those pull vaults handy, my friend. Each ruler had a different way of dealing with theft. It wasn't all the same. So you may have gotten off lucky sometimes. Sometimes, maybe, depends. Again, I'm talking about a time where people believed in witches. People who made ducking stools. They made fun new methods for punishing one another. So, you know, who's to really say? But depending on where you got caught, you might lose a body part or you might just get a slap on the wrist. The reality is, more often than not, anything over half a mark often resulted in death as a punishment. Number three, coffins. Now when you hear the word coffin, odds are you're thinking of vampires or you know, some dude like this in a wooden box, uncomfortable. Coffins in the medieval times are a little bit different. They're outside the front of the castles, these cages, they're usually, you know, hanging off of some dainty like street light looking thing. Usually a crow is pecking away at a skeleton. It's haunting. Those cages are coffins. The victim was placed inside said cage and the period of time they're kept there depends on your crime. Now of course people were left there to die a lot but instead of sharp metal or a rusty chair, people would burn in the sun and then starve to death until animals or birds finished them off. But here's the kicker. Yeah, it gets worse, believe it or not. While these coffins would be placed in open, hot areas, a lot of the time, more often than not, they would be placed in public areas. So crowds would gather, they would talk, and then throw stuff at the victim while they were serving their time day after day. Even though you weren't sentenced to death, the town may just vote otherwise. Number two, animal witches. Okay, if you have any pets watching this video, get them out of the room. Cover their little fluffy ears for this. I don't want them getting any ideas. One of the craziest things about looking back to the Salem witch trials has to be that animals were also found guilty of witchcraft. Yeah, like a pig went to trial. Actual court, grown adults would show up for animals. I'm dead serious. They would accuse animals of witchcraft and wizardry. Yep. I wonder what house this pig would belong into. I vote Slytherin. No better sous chef than a golden retriever, in my humble opinion. But to be fair, Airbud played like nine different sports, so you know, it could have happened. On the official list of victims from the Salem witch trials, two cats were accused, as well as two dogs. That's unbelievable. These villagers, their mindset was, if their pet was behaving strangely, it must mean that they're working with witches in the middle of the night. Why of course, why else? What are they, hungry or thirsty? Pfft, no, they're for sure witches. Villagers believed witches traveled at night not by broom per se, but by riding on the back of their pets. Yeah, it wasn't just dogs either. They thought that witches rode cows, pigs, wolves, dogs, even turtles. Imagine a witch riding a turtle. She would be so late to that cauldron cook-off. And finally, number one, Giles Corey. So after part one and now part two, we can safely conclude that the Salem witch trials were a bunch of bull yeah, a bit of a, a bit of bogus, I'd say. Out of the 27 people who had their lives taken away from them during the 1692 trials, 19 were hanged, 17 passed away in prison while serving their sentence, you know, being a witch and all. But the very last victim, Giles Corey, he refused to plead either innocence or guilty, and the law at the time states that you can't be tried otherwise. So they had to try and punish it out of Giles. They had to try and get him to confess so that they can take his land. Yeah, they used brutal measures as well. They laid a heavy board on top of the 81-year-old Giles Corey, and then over the course of two days, boulders were slowly added, making the weight more and more unbearable. They were hoping at this point that Giles would admit something, but every time they asked him anything about being a witch, Giles responded with the same sentence. He just responded with more weight. 
Yeah, keep them coming, he says. What a champ. After two days of this punishment, this excruciating pain, Corey did in fact pass away still in full possession of his estate, which then went to his son-in-law. Now, if he had been found guilty, the government would have taken that from him. So he sadly did the best thing he could have long-term for his family at this point by not admitting. I mean, he had to deal with some of the dumbest and most cruel people that ever walked Salem. It's, it's pretty much just that, nothing to do with Giles or his choices. It's just, hey, check out how insane this town was. Yep, that's history. Number 10, Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun, or also known as Traite de Verdun, was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, all the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire, and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are based off of. Basically, the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Frank Kingdom, and Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most. Come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child? This guy didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, Underground Castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. Shawshank Redemption 2, medieval edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid 1100s during England's civil war. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make Make every shot miss easily. I would just float near the net, tap the ball away. Like, nice try. Mm. Back to prison. Mm. Number eight. Stone masonry. So we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen, and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stone masons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course, there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This is like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry, he's always yelling, hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those, what are these? Yeah, the backwards, you idiot. I would have put the window down there. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I gotta drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, constructed, and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I s that's north. I got the... I got it, we're good. Number seven, forbidden shoes. 15th century shoes, look at these fancy things, come on. Imagine you have to help carry groceries, but you could only use these. Wouldn't be done. Krakows, or pikes, these were the talk of every town. The longer the toe extended, the more wealthy you seemed. And I'm talking like six inches sometimes. See Mike's beat? 
guy's huge. Dudes were tripping over their feet sometimes, it was crazy. Most importantly, the common folk were starting to look like royalty. Yeah, how dare you? How dare you look like the English crown, you poser? Finally, a law was passed in 1463. No knight under the rank of a lord, esquire, or gentleman, nor any other person shall wear any shoes or boots having spikes or points which exceed the length of two inches. That lasted until 1604. Yeah, God forbid you're wearing your dad's pikes and then you get busted. Too long, pal. Over two inches? going to the slammer. The punishment for a long pike was a fine of three shillings and four pence. Ah, do I have that? Oh, shoot. That's like 150 bucks today, give or take. Imagine that, all because of your shoes. All because you thought you were rich. Yeah, get a grip, peasant. Go change back in your Berks and socks. Number six, solitary confinement. This is a kind of punishment that still exists in our modern society. It's honestly one of the worst because of the type of psychological distress that it causes. Here we go. Basically, this form of punishment involves a prisoner living in a single cell with little to no meaningful contact with anybody else. That's the whole punishment. Now, the isolation that solitary confinement can create can be life altering for people. It's really bad. There are many stories about people being locked up for so long that eventually they just forget about their families entirely. Some people have gone away to solitary confinement for so long that once they're out, they can no longer speak. Isn't that crazy? Solitary confinement and the negative effects it has on one person is becoming a wider topic of conversation today because of said effects on a person's mental well-being, and it's a topic for a lot of human rights organizations. Yeah, rightfully so. Can't mess with the brain. Back in medieval times, solitary confinement was even worse. It was just a room made of stones. It was pitch black. It was freezing cold. It was also below some horrible, stinky castle, and most of the time, you weren't really alone. No, there were some hairy creatures nibbling away at your toes, but I'll save that for the end. That's pretty, pretty horrible. Number five, medieval tennis. Not to be confused with Mario Tennis, although that's probably just as hard to play, if we're being honest. Medieval Tennis was introduced in 1485, and just like the other insane ball game we covered today, this too was eventually banned. Yeah, that's how you know it's a good one. If you weren't a noble, you couldn't play tennis. You weren't allowed to. You could only play if it was Christmas. Yeah, so you better write that on your wish list. Many believe tennis was disrupting labor and encouraging violence and gambling. Yeah, tennis, encouraging violence. Imagine that. Tennis was eventually referred to as the sport of kings because both King Henry VII and VIII were actually pretty good at it. Yeah, they're like Venus and Serena Williams of medieval times, only not athletic and not nice and also not good at tennis. I mean, why else would you ban the sport, really? Let's be honest. Number four, one meal deal. Okay, so obviously food was a little sparse back in the medieval age. Uber Eats wasn't around yet, but you know what was? Disease, yeah, and, and, hor and worse things, yeah. The life expectancy wasn't great, but even so, laws were still put in place so the common folk wouldn't overindulge. Yeah, hey, I know times are rough, but uh, can you stress eat a little less? Thanks. Yeah, you just look a little gross. Yeah, King Henry VIII needs his ninth bowl of soup, so please stop. They were actually upset that the common folk were matching the lifestyle from higher ups. Nothing to do with supply, really, just appearance. In 1336, a law banned people from eating more than two courses. Soup also counted as one meal, not a sauce. Believe me, they asked. Again, the only exception here at the time, mid 1300s, was Christmas Day. Then you get to eat and have fun and play tennis. Yeah, the one day you can overindulge is the same day you can play tennis. They're like, oh, I can't. Now I can't. Number three, the thumb screw. A little less graphic, but still a horrible specific device used for punishments, dare I say. The thumb screw was used in the Middle Ages to get somebody to spill information or confess to a crime they probably didn't even commit in the first place. We didn't have anything else to detect lies, so these soldiers would make horrible devices to get you to spill the beans or lie and say you did, and then we can go home. This was one of the best cases, really, the thumb screw. It was also known as the thumbkin, and it would slowly crush your fingers, obviously. Just looking at it, you're like, uh, does it do what I think it does? Yeah, it does. This, of course, turned into the knee crusher, or even worse, the head crusher, which I obviously don't need to explain. Yeah, the classic medieval fork. Now they're getting creative, advancing their gadgets. Nice, we love it. I can't even imagine the knee crusher. That alone, no thank you, let's move on. Number two, the cake test. Of all the nonsensical tests performed during the Salem witch trials that we covered in part one and two, this one takes the cake. Yeah, pun intended, I did that on purpose. It sounds delicious, but in reality, it was just spreading the disease even more. This was a popular method of seeking out witchcraft in England as well. See, they would make a cake out of, well, you guessed it, rye flour. Remember that, rye flour. And then they would add a little bit of urine from the accused witch. 
Yeah, I'm more of a chocolate cake guy myself. Not a big fan of urine cake. But hey, who knows? Maybe I'll change. But don't worry, nobody ate this cake. Just an unfortunate village dog. Yeah, sad thing. They would feed this cake to a good boy, and then if the dog showed the same witchy symptoms, you know, being sick from said rye, then the town knew for sure that the accused was guilty. I just really wish one villager was like, maybe it's the pee. I'm just saying, number one, rats. Another Game of Thrones classic to finish off our horrible part three. If you're a rat person, I know there's a lot of people who do tricks with their rats and stuff, that's great, but cover their little eyes for this one. This is horrible, get them out of here. Rats were used as a medieval punishment. Ugh, where do I even start with this one? It was a punishment for the rats too, really. This is a two for one when it comes to pain. What was once called a rat trap involved a man being tied down to something, and then a metal enclosure or bucket being strapped to his abs or his chest. Inside this enclosure, there are rats, which the strapped down person can feel walking around in their skin. And then that's when the person, and still in the punishment, begins heating the other side of the metal enclosure. And historically, hot coals were usually placed on top, which of course, very quickly creates a hot environment for the rats inside. And many of you see where I'm going already, and you're like, ooh, yep, it's gonna happen. From here, the rats begin to frantically search for a way out, the softest way out, because just like us, they have survival instincts. And the metal enclosure is too hard to bite into, but a human's flesh, that's definitely not. Number 10. Watch party. Marriage. Nothing like legally tying yourself to another human being for the rest of your life. Everyone loves a good wedding, but if I was invited to one in the Middle Ages, well, you can count me out of the final event. You see, it was popular at the time to prove your marriage is legit, and one way of doing that was consummating it. But we can't just take your word for it, don't be silly, no. Instead, every member of your family, and maybe some members of the court if you're royal, will come with you into the bedchamber to spectate and make sure the deed is done. Imagine being the lady, who would sometimes be carried to the chamber by her family members. Now, obviously, things were a little different then. Marriages were not really a thing of love, it was strictly business. And of course, they had different ideas of what exactly was private. So this is purely from our modern point of view, but I can imagine it was particularly uncomfortable having your least favorite cousin in the room. Number nine, Ivan the Terrible, the first Tsar of Russia. A man who was as cold and brutal as the winters that surrounded him. Ivan had it rough growing up. Both of his parents pulled a Bruce Wayne and passed away when he was very young. Afterwards, he and his siblings were not raised the best. Once described as having nothing but rags to wear, which in that climate must have been awful. So, did little Ivan grow up to be a super rich yet dark hero bent on serving the criminals of the night cold justice, just like his Gotham counterpart? No, no he did not. He became wealthy, but awful. Terrible, some might say. There are a hundred stories about Ivan and his cruelty, but my favorite is that of St. Basil Cathedral. You know the one. Anytime Russia is shown on TV, it's like a North Pole Christmas Onion Palace looking thing. You know the one I'm talking about. After it was completed, he had the architect's eyes gouged out so no one could ever build anything more beautiful. <sighs> Number eight. Red card. Actually, I doubt anyone was given a red card when they played soccer back in the day. It would have just been too difficult to even determine who it was exactly that got the card. The rules of the medieval precursor to soccer were pretty, um, basic. There basically weren't any. In Shrove Tide football, the goals could be a couple hundred yards to miles apart. There were an unlimited number of players, and the only rule literally says that you could use any means necessary to score apart from the actual ending of someone's life. It still happened though, even by accident, because you take every man from your village or even from two different opposing villages and you take one leather bladder ball and say, do whatever you can to score. People are gonna get punched, kicked, stomped on, trampled, bruised, bloodied, and de-lifed. This mob football was hated by lords and kings. Edward II, Edward III, Richard II, and Henry IV all tried to have it banned, but, well, have you ever met a football or soccer fan? Number seven, public de-lifing. There were jails and dungeons in medieval times, sure, make no mistake of that. However, a lot of times sentencing for crimes would often lead you to losing your head, where a large sweaty man, such as myself, wearing a black cloth mask would take a very sharp axe, sword, or any other sharp utensil of war from the war cabinet and liberate your head from your shoulders. Thing is, some folks would come out to watch this, as this was apparently a form of entertainment. I mean, why not, I guess, sure. Sure, it's, fr it's friendly family fun. Bring the youngins, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa. 
pack some sandwiches just to make sure, just make sure you stay out of the splash zone. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why they did that. That was pretty common. That's weird. Number six, Wario shoes. Fashion. I'm not a fashion guy, and I don't claim to be. I don't have the cash flow for it. But one day, I swear, if I got the do re mi, it'll be leisure suits and Frank Sinatra every time I sit down to eat a meal. Gotta have those shoes to match that Frank energy. Shoes that say, yes, I'm moderately talented and handsome and have a great following, but I have some shady connections to the Italian mafia. <laughs> Villain energy. Well, what's more villainous than a pair of Wario shoes? Yes, some medieval shoes were big and pointy and sometimes floppy. It was a sign of wealth, class, prestige, and the calling card of a portly Mario doppelganger. Surely you might not even wear these bad boys outside, but that's because you trip and fall, and I wouldn't want to trip and fall out there. I feel like any injury back then is uh, not good for your health. A cut could kill you, you know, you don't want that. Number five, animals on trial. All right, look, this one just doesn't make any sense. Zero sense. Law and Order. Besides being a great TV show, some would say it's the best thing we've ever come up with. Actual Law and Order, not, not the show. Thank goodness the system is perfect and never fails anyone ever. Well, they used to put animals on trial. I'm gonna say that again. They used to put animals on trial. Not sure how that works though. When cross-examining the witness, at what point do you call this BS? When you realize there's a barnyard animal on trial for a crime, or when the witness response is moo or oink. Like what, you know? Like I don't know, it's, it's just silly. Unless people in the dark ages could actually talk to animals, and we since lost that ability as people. Nah, I'm just kidding, that's just weird. Just don't do that. Don't, don't put animals on trial, dude. Number four, consummation of the union. I know I couldn't. I just couldn't do it. This is a story just as old as time itself. You get married, Pope's happy, dad's happy with it, mom's happy, you got a blushing bride, what more do you need? That sounds great, right? Well, well, uh, things would be great, but you have to sign off on the marriage. Cross your T's, dot your I's, so to speak. Train going into the tunnel, the bedroom dance, the hanky panky. What bad marriages only do on birthdays and Hanukkah? Yeah, you know. Well, if that isn't depressing enough, how about having the family come and watch like they just subbed to ye the OnlyFans? No, not just your family, but religious nobles, respectable people in your community. And they're going to watch you do the deed. They're there to make sure the marriage is complete. I just, do you, do you cheer on? I don't know, like, that's just so weird. Number three, pale skin. Ladies, beauty, and the industry. Look, there's a lot of things that can bring you up, bring you down. The makeup industry can be kind of tough to wrap your head around. It's, it's crazy, I know that. And there's been some crazy ideas out there throughout history. I think Medieval Times takes the cake though. You start with hair. All right, so we're going for the George Costanza look. Balding or receding hairline, beautiful. No eyebrows and no eyelashes, oh, even better. If this look wasn't enough for you, now you gotta make your skin pale, like really pale. And the only sure way to do that, ladies, is bloodletting, which I hate talking about every time it comes up. I hate it, dude. Time to bleed for beauty, ladies, and as if that's not already done already. You let some blood go and you feel a little lightheaded, but now you're finally ready for the ball. Look, the hair thing, it doesn't matter. It doesn't define anything. Wear it how you want. Please don't hurt me, Will Smith. But the blood thing? I just, I can't recommend that to anyone. Don't, don't lose your blood for, to, to go pale. I, oh, that's a horrible feeling. Number two, Dracula's grave. Vampires, they're real. Sadly though, they're not as gorgeous as the ones seen on the big screen and TV. Well, at least the people in medieval Europe thought they were real. So real that they used to take extra measures to make sure they could sleep soundly at night. Don't want your precious life juice sucked out of your neck. Unless it's for beauty, because that's normal. Do you have a family member who always checks to see if the oven is turned off before you leave the house? Well, this is kind of like that, except it was burials and driving wooden stakes to the hearts of cadavers. Just in case, you know? A little vampire insurance, if you will. We went from being afraid of those who fear garlic to wanting to date them. How the tables have turned. Number one, night, knighthood. As cool as it may seem in the movies or games, I personally wouldn't want to be a part of it. Knights were warriors of a noble class who started learning and training at a very young age. Squires and knighthood. A militaristic education ain't the worst thing ever, sure, but it's, it's the war and fighting itself that scares me. This is brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat we're talking about here. Swords and shields, bows and arrows, horseback warfare. Nothing can fully prepare you for that. Personally, the armor is not an issue. Not moving around in it, it's actually more flexible than you might think. Seriously, look, it, it is, it's more flexible. It's the idea of trying to take off the armor after returning from battle and running around and slaying the enemy all day. Yeah. 
Chaping in metal cannot be fun, just saying. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Battle of Hastings. Okay, we look back at jesters and jugglers of the Dark Ages, and we laugh. We chuckle a little bit, rightfully so. The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century. It was one of the best jobs to have, despite how, you know, Game of Thrones made jesters look. It was an honorable job. The fool's payment also was no joke, my friend. Roland Le Petour was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II, so long as he kept farting and juggling. Not, not a bad gig. Don't let looks deceive you, however. During the Battle of Hastings on October 1066, it had one of the most badass minstrels I have ever heard of. No jokes with this guy, that's for sure. Now, for starters, this was the same battle where William the Conqueror defeated King Harold. Historic, of course, one of the bloodiest battles in history. How it all began, though. William's minstrel, his fool, sang at English troops while he was juggling his sword around. He was singing, he was doing a little show. He's juggling and saying some probably nasty things. That's when an English soldier came forward to challenge Taylor Fair, and then he was promptly killed. And so began one of the bloodiest battles in history. Yeah, he taunted them until they made the first move. Is that allowed? I'd be so upset. I'd be upset. Number nine, Malin Matt's daughter. On part one, we had a few cases where women were found guilty of practicing witchcraft. Of course. Now, this was a common theme for the Dark Ages, sadly, but it's one thing for a town to randomly turn against you out of the blue because they're spooked, whatever the case, but imagine your family, someone who actually knows you. That's exactly what happened to Malin Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow, and her own daughter told everybody in town that she was a witch. Yeah, she was the last victim of the Great Swedish Witch Hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully one of the last, but two, she never admitted. Mm, no way, she's like, nope, I'm not a witch. That's it. She didn't cry out in pain, she didn't beg for forgiveness, anything like that. She said it was all hogwash and she stood by it quietly. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury, so she too met a similar fate. Don't talk smack about your mothers. Number eight, toilet trouble. What a transition. Here on Bumblebee, we've talked a lot of smack about ancient toilets. God, they were so bad, I can't. I, I would never, I would hold it for 36 years. Apparently these things could also take lives, yeah. In the middle of the summer, nobody around you, you could have been a victim to a medieval toilet. Yeah, how does that happen? Let's talk about it. In 1523, a Cambridge baker named George Duncan, he went out to the cesspit and the guy sadly fell in. Now normally you could just crawl back out, sure, but this fateful day, Duncan was quite intoxicated. The poor guy suffocated in his own what a horrible way to go out. One of the worst ways to go out. Number seven, War of the Bucket. One can make the argument that war is useless, pointless, an act of brutality and waste. Well, two towns in Italy would tell you to move out of the way because somebody stole our bucket. Yes, that's right. To make a very long story short, at this time and place in Europe, there was a ton of political strife, especially between the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. All this nonsense boiled down to two towns, Bologna and Modena. Sounds like baloney, but it's Modo I think it's Bologna. Anyway, the towns were close and supported different political beliefs, one supporting the emperor, one supporting the pope, and it, they were feuding. And eventually, they would go to war over a stolen bucket. Except actually during my research, it turns out the bucket may have been stolen after the war was over. It's kind of gets a little muddy there because a long time ago, but the, the point still stands. They were fighting for non nonsensical reasons, not very nice. Number six, the fashion police. You're wearing stripes, <laughs> ew. Don't you know polka dots are in? No, it was more like you're wearing stripes. The garment of the devil, get him. Call the guy who gets rid of people. Yes, wearing stripes could lead to your demise. In 1310 in the French town of Rune, a local cobbler was condemned to the end simply because he'd been caught in striped clothing. In 1295, Pope Boniface, nice name, the eighth, issued a papal decree banning religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. From the year 1250, the only people who could be caught wearing stripes were the ladies of the night, lepers and cripples, it's sort of a rebellious way of showing they were outsiders. How very punk. And I'm kind of wearing stripes right now, so uh-oh, call the medieval police, uh-oh. Number five, Revenge of the Slain. Vikings, you love them. We've talked about Vikings a few times here on this channel. You know what they're all about. Swords, longboats, pillaging, all that great stuff. Throw in some Norse mythology, and you got yourself a textbook Viking. However, one story from the Vikings always reminds me to stay grounded. And like I always say, don't sniff your own farts. It's not good for you. Well, this is a story of arrogance. Sigurd the Mighty versus Bucktooth Brigtip. 
The battle ended with victory in Sigurd's corner, and with Bucktooth's head on a string tied to Sigurd's horse. Sigurd was thinking of beautiful lasses, mead, and a chance to lay down and relax as he galloped on his way home. The trouble is, the head of Bucktooth had a Bucktooth, that's why they gave him the name, and found its way into Sigurd's thigh. Now that wasn't enough to dethrone the mighty warrior, but however, it was enough to get him sick. Very sick, where he would actually succumb to his infection. Ooh, awkward. Number 4, Henry VIII. Divorced, beheaded, unalived, divorced, beheaded, survived. Do you ever get the title of Defender of the Faith for writing a treaty against a heretic and then just starting a religious revolution, creating a whole different church? I know, right? Just to be able to divorce your wife? <laughs> Did you ever do all this in the name of having a male son? Well, King Henry VIII of England did. Yes, that's right. We talked about him a few times here, too. King Henry had six wives in total. They were Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. He clearly had a thing for Anne's and Catherine. Henry's dad, the seventh Henry, was king because of the War of the Roses, which was incredibly bloody to carry on the Tudor line. Number three, Sleeping General. William Wallace, great guy, good movie. A little overrated in my opinion, but still worth the watch. I just prefer my Mel Gibson and Lethal Weapons. Diplomatic immunity, you know what I'm saying? What do William Wallace and oversleeping have in common? Well, for those who had their moms rushing you out the door all the way up until you were 18, it can put a wrench in your plans. John D. Warren was in charge of defending against the Scottish Rebellion. He had his hands full, that's for sure. Wallace was no joke. So you can understand why in one battle, he overslept. His men began showing up, taking the lines, taking positions. Hey, but the boss wasn't there. Where's the boss? Have you seen the boss? Where is he? What's going on? Wallace, seeing an opportunity, seized it. And the Scots won the day and went on to fight for independence. The lesson here? When mom says get out of bed, you gotta get out of bed. Number two, tough interview. YouTube won't let me say the word, but it's when someone has certain information and another party wants said information. Now, when the information isn't coming out, you gotta get it out. Medieval Times gave us a whole bunch of fun ways to extract information. If you went into a castle dungeon, you might find hammers, nails, knives, screws, rope, leather, whips, chains, pulleys, wheels, chairs, water, fire, oil, claws, grabbers, and maybe the most simple and famous, the rack, which is basically just a fancy table that you get stretched out on until thou can no longer be stretched anymore. You'd like to think it was used on criminals, but the truth is it was used on many people, including criminals. A lot of times it was innocent folks simply labeled as heretics and they would suffer from these tools of horror. Not cool, dude. Not cool. Not so great. Don't like that. Number one, Streets of Blood. The Crusades. Oh baby, what an adventure those were, right? Super fun, awesome adventure time with all your favorite friends from church. That sounds like a great time. Well sadly, it wasn't all fun and games. It was basically a holy war and a lot of folks got uh, de-lifed. That's not very nice. One particular story talks about how during the Crusades, the streets of Jerusalem were flooded with the life of juice, the juice of life, the red Kool-Aid, the stuff that makes Chetty Quiz hit night, blood. That's right, it said it was flooded with it. Each time aside in the Crusades did something heinous, it seems it was always returned with another heinous act. We move beyond, we, we move past that now. We move. Number 10, medical treatment. Honestly, up until about 1945, medical treatment methods were just but it's just awful. Like, you'll find out later in this list, infections were pretty serious. We also know that there was some quackery afoot. Doctors gave treatments that worked and some, well, they just didn't. I however think the worst of the worst was surgery. Any surgery, no anesthetic. Okay, so maybe someone removing a boil might not be that bad, but a very common procedure back in the day was amputation. Whether it was a grievous war injury, sickness, or an accident, when a limb needed to be lobbed off, it was going to suck. Bone, muscle, arteries, tendons, just, oh boy, all the juicy stuff that makes me lightheaded. And what makes all the horror fans shriek at night with the light. Say what you will about healthcare now, but just be thankful it ain't that. Number nine, body carrier. Go to school, get a job, work, and live. It's simple. Here in the Western world, you got options. Maybe you want to be a doctor, a pilot, or maybe even a lawyer. Johnny Depp needs your help right now. So maybe, maybe be a lawyer, call him up. Say, Johnny, I can help you. Well, someone who could have used the help was the body collector. During medieval times, diseases were a big problem. The main culprit, of course, being the Black Plague. Folks were going belly up, left, right, and center. The body collector's job was to literally collect the people who perished in their homes and the streets and bring them outside the city. Boy, what a lovely sight. And like I said, the corpses were carried outside of the city. What's more disturbing than that is it was done because 
there was no space to bury them. Too many. And for them, they didn't think it was an issue of germs and hygiene. They just did it because there wasn't enough room. Oh. If you want to ruin your lunch, Google search images of black plague symptoms. Yucky. No good. Gross. Don't like it. Number 8. Ill-equipped. On more of a macro scale here, but back in medieval times, if you were a peasant, you were expected to fight for your lord whenever called upon. Whether that's resisting foreign invaders or fighting the neighboring towns whose lords didn't show up to your lord's birthday party. That was a good joke, Adam wrote that one. You had to be there whether you wanted to be or not. Joining up with the army in modern times could lead you to learn useful skills and could be a great career choice. It could be. But back then, the lords who forced you to fight for them were just terrified of you, so they taught you nothing, supplied you with no weapons, forcing you to use whatever farming tools really you had at home. And your military camps were so basic, more people probably bit the dust from getting sick than really going into battle. It wasn't a good time, I can tell you that. Number seven, human decorations. Sticking with the theme of crazy dudes from Europe comes one of the craziest, Vlad the Impaler. Sure, Ivan was bad, but imagine being so bad, so awful, that your alias is a verb for what you do to people. So specific. For example, Adam would be Adam the talker during movies. Ugh, worse. Or Adam the bedwetter. Not that I've ever wet the bed or anything. What? Don't even ask. What? Don't ask my mom. What? Well, Vlad has this weird knack for decorating. The enemies of his kingdom would meet a terrible fate. Think of how bad a toothpick would hurt if someone poked you with it. Okay, now imagine it's a large, sharp wood pike that some lovely gentleman would sit you on. Ugh. As you slowly become one with the pike, you look around and see a field of others who have also met the same fate. The sky turns blood red. Black thick clouds form as the moon beams through and shines down on the beast of a man who would dare do this to his people. Vlad the Impaler, a man who did unspeakable things and was the inspiration for Dracula. Who knew, right? Who thought? Who, did, who, who thought? Number six, body on trial. And where were you on the night of April the 27th? You see, members of the jury, his stunned silence only proves his guilt. Pope Stephen VI was an interesting guy, but I think the most interesting thing he may have done was in 897 when he ordered Pope Formosus, the last guy in his position, dug up and put on trial. What's worse than digging up a dude and yelling at him in a courtroom, finding him guilty, taking away his papal finery and a few fingers, and then reburying him? Digging him back up again and throwing him in the Tiber River. Apparently, the whole thing was possibly a way of covering up the crimes that Pope Stephen had committed because, you see, this guy was one of the first popes to bring on what people call the most corrupt era in the history of the papacy. This pope didn't last too long, thanks to some unsurprising mob justice. And the next guy who became pope, thankfully, outlawed the whole mortal husk on trial thing. Number five. War! What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. War, what is it good for? Well, if you need oil, it actually kind of works out. Yes, it's warm, it's bad, it's naughty, and we've been doing it forever. I haven't gonna do more specifics, but I'll save that for a part two, maybe. We'll see. I'm talking more about the brutality of medieval combat. Swords, shields, spears, pikes, halberds, axes, hammers, maces, bows, crossbows, catapults, trebuchets, rams, fire arrows, and if you're a fan of Ocarina of Time, ice arrows. I'm not sure how that works, but Link's magical. We'll go with it. The truth is, medieval combat was brutal, walking miles to every battle, sometimes with limited supplies, which meant sometimes armies pissed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not nice. If you were injured in battle, there was a high chance that you would get infected. And then that's picture wrap for you. It's a time of knights and glory, but also a time of great war and loss. All a guy can hope for is that whatever knight is going to cut me up like a sushi roll, well, at least I'd hope he had the decency to disinfect his weapons with their favorite brand of disinfectant. Come on, let's be serious here. Number four, not the kitties. We all know that apparently black cats are bad luck, and that two of them in a row signifies a glitch in the matrix. You have Pope Gregory IX to thank for that. In 1232, Greg wrote Vox in Rama, which supposedly exposed the rituals of a cult of witches that lived in northern Germany. Among some of the things they summoned, including the big red with horns himself, was a black cat that appeared to be kissed and adored by the worshippers. The Great Cat. You've already heard of witch hunters, well now you've heard of cat hunters. People took the great cat mentioned in Vox and Rama and applied that idea to every cat. And they did not hold back, like at all. The cat population almost got to extinction point. 
Didn't work out too well for them when rat populations saw a huge increase not too much later though, huh? Touch my cat and you ain't making it to tomorrow, that's all I'm saying. Number 3 Criminal Cookoff Criminals, they're everywhere and have been since the dawn of time. It also seems that since the dawn of time, people have been coming up with lots of different ways to deal with said criminals. One of the medieval favorites of the Holy Roman Empire was boiling criminals in oil. Nice! Save for the truly heinous crooks and those who dare defraud coinage. Yes, that's right, don't dare fraud the coin or you could end up like last night's suckling duck. Boiling oil was even used in defense during castle sieges. Get too close to the walls and, well, you'd get a boiling barrel of Crisco's finest as hair grease. Boiling oil leaves horrible burns and is extremely painful. I don't know, I shouldn't have to tell you that. If you ever cook bacon without a shirt on, then you know. The kind of grit you need to stay close to that sizzling pan, I, I envy you. Because yeah, those things totally relate though, absolutely. Number two, Pope Not So Innocent the Third. Look, I'm sorry I'm talking about Pope so much, but you gotta know that a heck of a lot of horrible things that happened in the Middle Ages were caused by the decisions of the church, and specifically, that one little decision of forcefully dealing with anyone who disagrees or insults your religion. For example, in 1209, there was a group of heretics called the Cathari in southern France who believed that the Roman Catholic Church itself was established by the same people who brought an end to the life of Christ. Now, that didn't really fly too well with Pope Innocent III, who in response launched the Albigensian Crusade that became a 20 year long full military campaign. A particular event that's worthy of mention here is when the Crusaders took the town of Toulouse. The soldiers couldn't figure out who the heretics were among the people there, so Commander Simone de Montfort said, destroy them all, the devil will know his own. That's messed up, dude. Number one, something going around. Another warfare related one here, but this one is just awful. I'll make this one brief. Basically, you got a castle that needs entering or a palace that needs a good siege. You get your catapults ready, you load them up with the secret sauce. And by that, I mean these bad boys were loaded with the latest commoners who had succumbed to the bubonic plague. Yes, they were launching plague bodies over walls in hopes that it would make the enemy sick. And sometimes they would even fling some poop over there. Oof. It's such a smart move though, right? It's just so heinous and gross. When it was all said and done, I bet there was no hand washing to be found. Just Number 10, the Doomsday Book, 1085. The Doomsday Book was created under William the First, also known as William the Conqueror. Like you're already the first man, you don't need two names, come on. This guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this is the very first time surveyors went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for simply just doing you. Men would show up at your house asking how much money you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh? Okay. And five on that phone plan. Look, tax season's coming up, Arthur. It's not looking good, man. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Imagine owing someone money for just trying to make an honest living. Yeah, thank God that didn't catch on, right guys? Oh, speaking of, I got a phone H&R block. Number nine, the Crusades. A three part mini series spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for the proprietorship over sacred sites and the land in the East Mediterranean. A three part mini series spanning over 200 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred sites and land in the East Mediterranean. Wars that resulted in six million deaths. The Knights Templar, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers horseback bashing their way through the east. These guys were the real deal, almost like the Navy SEALs of their time. We've seen these paintings, the elite fighting force with the red cross painted on their chests. I wonder if they had to do a hell week. These soldiers were the most trained and savage fighters in all the Christian armies. Richard I leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary. It was never like Richard the Clownfish or Henry the Pygmy Goat. No, 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 we need fear way more fear. Number eight, the Magna Carta. The year's 1215. We need some laws, people. This document was one of its kind. A document setting out the laws and limitations from the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts. No free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers and the law of the land. Did you get all that? Right there down. Except women, they don't have laws. And they can't act in place. Sometimes people needed to face the music. And even animals. Huh? 
That's right, animals. Being tried in a court. A lively and popular event trying any law-breaking animal from goats to pigs to even chickens. Ladies and gentlemen of the court, did you, Mr. Feathersworth, peck the floor, yes or no? Objection, Your Honor, leading the witness. My brain can't fathom this, guys. I number seven, Fuller. Wool was a very important part of life for people back in the Middle Ages. They were able to make all sorts of things out of it, and because it was waterproof because of the natural oils in the wool, it made processing the wool quite easy. But soon people found out that whatever they made out of the wool ended up being quite coarse and frayed easily. They figured that if they removed the oil from the wool, then it would make the overall product a little nicer, which it did, but the oil removing process definitely wasn't pleasant. Back then, in order to get the oils off wool, people called fullers would process the wool by pouring stale urine over it and then stomping on it. They needed some kind of alkaline solution to dissolve the oils and urine was the best and most abundant solution. What makes this extra gross though is the fact that when it came to big batches of wool, they would have needed the urine of a bunch of people to get the job done. So that means that the fuller would have been sloshing around in the urine of like half the town. Gross. At number six, Ostiary. In the Middle Ages, religion played a big part in the lives of the people and there were actually quite a few jobs centered around having something to do with the church. This is true with ostiaries, who worked almost like a secretary for the church. This position was normally held by a man who wanted to move up in the church's hierarchy. He was basically doing a menial task to butt kiss his way to the top. Ostiaries were tasked with being kind of like a church bouncer. They would make sure that unbaptized people didn't come into the church during certain times, and they would also man the doors during baptisms. This profession was based on the Roman habit of having a slave guard the doors of their master's house. At number five, bear leader. Now here's a really strange job from the Middle Ages, which sounds both terrifying but also kind of cool. Back in the Middle Ages, blood sports were all the rage. Many of the monarchs who ruled during this time were obsessed with watching blood sports, which honestly kind of explains a lot, but that's besides the point. One of the most popular blood sports was bear baiting, which involved making a pack of dogs fight a bear. Sounds gruesome, but it also begs the question, well, where did you get the bear? Well, that's where bear leaders came into play. For bear leaders, their whole job was to lead bears from village to village so that they could participate in blood sports. Now it sounds super dangerous because, well, we're talking about a big bear, but imagine how much of a flex that would be to say, yeah, I wrangle bears for a living. Like, how cool would that be? Now that's something to put in your Tinder bio. At number four, the piss prophet. As we all know, medicine wasn't all that advanced in the Middle Ages. There were no actual doctors, and the people you would have visited if you were feeling unwell were the same people who doubled as barbers, so I don't know how accurate their medical diagnosis would be. In medieval England, people didn't really know much about health, and many people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. The people who collected people's urine samples were called piss prophets, and they had their own criteria for determining what was going on in someone's body based on their urine. According to the piss prophets, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color, and that meant that everything was working properly. If it was wine colored, like blue or black, then it meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were because medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. At number three, muckraker. In our last video about unusual jobs from the Middle Ages, I told you guys about a job where people had to clean up human waste with ladles and then transport it elsewhere to keep the town clean. But there is another profession along those same kind of lines that I'd like to tell you about. Muckrakers were the people who were responsible for cleaning waste off the streets in whatever town they were in. You see, back then, people kind of just disposed of their waste wherever they pleased. But since this waste, like human and animal excrement, rotting food, and entrails had nowhere to go and kind of just sat around the streets, you can just imagine how disgusting that must have been. So that's where muckrakers came in. These were brave people who basically rode around town, collecting waste off the ground and throwing it into carts to then be transported out of the city. As horrible as this job may sound though, these people actually made a lot of money. Muckrakers could make in 11 days the same amount as another laborer makes in 6 months. Would you do this job if it made you rich? At number 2, Arming Squires. 
I've talked about squires in a previous list about medieval knights, and if you've watched that video, then you might be familiar with how unpleasant the life of a squire could be. At a certain point in their training, a squire would be tasked with basically being an assistant to a knight, and a lot of their assistance was guided towards the knight's armor and weaponry. In the Middle Ages, arming squires were given the task of maintaining the knight's armor. So this meant that they had to make sure that the armor was clean and properly attached to the knight's body. This job was so serious that sometimes the arming squire would have to run out into the battlefield in the middle of a fight to tend to their knight's armor, which meant that they were risking their lives for a couple hunks of metal. And finally, at number one, peer finders. Now I think this last job on our list must be one of the worst ones by far. We've talked about how people harvested leeches, cleaned waste off the streets, and stomped on urine-soaked wool, but imagine if your job was just to go around the town and pick up as much dog poop as you possibly could. This was basically what people called peer finders would do. Dog poop was essentially used as a drying agent by tanneries to make leather for bookbinding. This was a lot of people's full-time jobs, but imagine how crappy this job would have been. I'll see myself out. Number 10, Naughty Naughty. There's a reason we don't do things like we did in ye olde times. We didn't know, but now we do. So there's really no excuse for acting up. A very common practice for marriage back in ye olde times was to marry a girl at the age of 12. And in case you're wondering, no, the man was nowhere close to the same age. Yes, it's just as gross as you think. No, I'm not happy talking about it, but that's just the way things went. I can just imagine how happy those young ladies were when their parents came to them and said, listen, the Lord across town fancies you and the dude's got the bag. So you're gonna marry him so mommy and daddy can get the bag too. That's just one example of the medieval business transaction. I mean, marriage. Marriage, marrying for love. <laughs> Number nine, pull up a chair. The people of my generation either struggled to phone the doctor to make an appointment because of crippling anxiety, or they flaunted on OnlyFans. There's no in between. However, I still think most people would feel uncomfortable finalizing their marriage in front of a party of witnesses. I honestly cannot think of a more awkward situation. Do you cheer them on? Are, are there sports commentators talking about the moves? Are there snacks? You could be there for 30 seconds, or 10 minutes depending on who you're watching. It just seems like a lot of unpleasant viewing to walk out of a room later to then all agree that yes, yes indeed, that couple is married now. But hey, that's just how it went. Witnesses or family would watch you do what animals do on the Discovery Channel. Number eight, the birth factory. Soap and sanitation is one of the greatest things ever invented. Don't you just love taking a hot shower after a long day? Oh, I know I do. Hygiene was not the greatest back then, and while not the only factor, it did contribute to a high infant mortality rate. It was just one of the many factors. So when young women were married, and married rather quickly, it was time to start pumping babies out. It's more of a quantity over quality kind of thing. Before marriage was declared a holy sacrament, these things were happening everywhere. Pubs, town squares, heck, even in your house. Now, for the people at home, can you tell me how you feel about the holy sanctity of marriage? Especially if you've been married for more than 10 years. Does it feel good? I bet it does. At number seven, Reeve. These days we have elected officials in our communities who serve as a sort of voice of the people. Back in the Middle Ages, they sort of had someone similar to that and they were called Reeves. The Reeve was something of a local administrator and their job was to oversee the day-to-day -day running of a manor as well as to solve disputes between the peasants. The Reeve was a peasant too, but they were normally elected by their neighbors or chosen specifically by a lord and served as a Reeve for a one-year period. This job eventually faded away as the feudal system began to decline, but fun fact, you can still find some Reeves in parts of Canada. At number six, Peddler. This next job from the Middle Ages is one that we kind of still have these days, just a little more modern. We're talking about peddlers. You know how there are people who go door to door trying to sell you something? Like back in the day when Avon used to do house calls? Well, this was essentially what peddlers did. Their job was to travel from village to village to sell various goods. This was how a lot of people in more remote areas were able to buy certain items. The peddler's job was pretty important for the local economy because it was able to bring business to larger areas than just one local town. It seemed like a good enough job, but socially speaking, peddlers were always looked at with suspicion. Oftentimes, local people would accuse peddlers of being criminals. Now, they easily could have been criminals, but it's really a case-by-case -case situation. You can't judge someone for just trying to get their coin. At number five, Gong Farmer. Now, 
Now even though there were simple jobs like being a scribe and carrying water to people, there were also some messy and not so glamorous jobs as well. This next one I'm about to tell you about was definitely one of the worst jobs that you could have. See, there was a time before modern sewers and plumbing were a thing. This was a pretty icky time because rather than waste being disposed of in sewers, they were deposited into a privy or cesspit. Now these things had to be cleaned out periodically and guess what? There were people who were hired to do just that. The gong farmer was someone who was hired to maintain the cesspits and so they would be given a large ladle and they would scoop out the waste and transport it away. Now I can only imagine how horrible that job would have been and how horrendous the smell would have been too. It sounds like an absolute nightmare so I'm glad it's not a thing anymore. At number 4, Galley Rower. Now as bad as it might have been to be a gong farmer in the middle ages, there was apparently a job that was much worse that people would do anything to get out of and that was the galley rower. This was considered to be one of the most grueling jobs from the middle ages and I can see why. These people would be tasked with working on a galley and rowing a ship along with a team of up to a thousand other people. Apparently people hated this job so much that they would try and avoid being picked to be a galley rower at all costs. Many people would join the pre priesthood in order to become exempt from becoming a galley rower. Usually this job would go to the poorest peasants and even slaves as it became more and more difficult to find people for the job. That was one occupation that everyone agreed was the worst. At number 3, cup bearer. Now this is a job that I wish was still around. Not because it's a great job or anything, but I feel like it could have been cool to have my own personal cup bearer so I could feel like a queen, you know? The job of the cup bearer was pretty self explanatory. Their whole occupation was to serve the monarch their drinks. Now I know I said I would have wanted a cup bearer so I could feel like a bougie queen, but the cup bearer's job was a little more important than just serving drinks. See, there was always the fear that the reigning monarch could get poisoned because it was a very common act of treason back in the Middle Ages. The cupbearer was the only person tasked with serving drinks to the king or queen because they had to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, even if it meant tasting the drink themselves before serving it just to make sure that all was well in the cup. A lot of trust had to be put into this cupbearer so they could be quite influential in the courts if all went well. They were risking their lives and safety doing a pretty basic task, but it was for the good of the realm. At number 2, Alewife. Speaking of drinks though, let's talk about how the drinks got into the cups and who made them. In medieval England, women were mostly tasked with the practice of brewing ale and they were aptly named alewives as a result. Alewives were very important not only for business but also for the good of their families. Brewing was a quote, small scale, low investment, low profit, low skilled industry, but it brought success to a lot of married women as well as a substantial amount of independence since this would have essentially been their business and their own source of income. These women would always be hard at work brewing because they sold their ale quite quickly. Ale didn't have a very long shelf life and so they would make and sell their beverages quickly to keep up with demands and to compete effectively with others in the trade. Eventually though, the alewife was extinguished by the 15th century as brewing became more commercialized and people sought to take the independence of women away. And finally at number 1, Alchemist. As you can probably imagine, science wasn't all that advanced back in the middle ages. There wasn't really much understanding of how the world worked. Back in these days, there were people who tried to practice science in a way that they knew how before many advancements in the field came out and these people were called alchemists. These alchemists believed that it was possible to change metals and chemicals. They tried to purify metals to change them into other things and one of the most common experiments was trying to convert tin into gold or silver. For other alchemists though, their mission was to come up with new medicines to heal people and cure them of their ailments. Alchemists were quite popular until the 17th century as the ideas behind alchemy were replaced by the science of chemistry. Yeah. 